A reading from both our epistle and gospel text. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes in Je- that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water alone, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For these three testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. From our Gospel text, Unless I see his hands and the marks of the nails, and I place my finger in the mark of the nails, I will, and, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, Jesus' disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Thus far the gospel of the Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All of our readings today are testified to our Lord. In the Valley of Dry Bones, you've heard me preach before that the reason that, uh, that it's recorded in Ezekiel that the bones were dry is to fully cement the understanding that they were really, 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 really dead. That they had been dead for a very long time. They were as dead as dead could be. Not, there, was no, there was not even a bit of marrow in them. And this entire valley of dry bones is but a graveyard. And after all, that's what a cemetery or a graveyard is, a valley of bones. And in Ezekiel, we see the Son of Man speaking with God and God speaking with him, saying, if you prophesy over these bones, this is what I'll do. I will lay sinew upon them and then give them flesh and then give them skin and then give them breath and then they will be alive. And then, as I looked and behold, after prophesying, there was sinew on them. There was flesh that had come upon them, uh, come upon them and there was skin that covered them, but there was no breath in them. And here there's a separation between body and breath. In other words, there's also a separation between death and life. You don't have to be dry bones to be dead, you just have to not be alive. That's the only prerequisite for being dead, is not being alive. And I don't think I'm bringing any new biological uh, uh, news to anyone. But why the separation here between the dead and the living? And why? Because Because the Lord said, I will do these things, sinew, flesh, skin, breath, life. He says it in that order. And then when the prophecy comes, what happens? Sinew, flesh, skin. But then nothing. Until there's a pause. And it even says there was no breath in them. And then he says, okay, now we have a person. But a person is not a person unless he has breath. So prophesy, O Son of Man, and say to the breath, Come from the four winds and breathe. Breathe on these slain. In other words, dead. Even though they had sinew and flesh and skin. That they may live. And there arose an army. The whole host of Israel right in front of them. Living, breathing, saved, and everything. And if that's not enough to freak you out, 
There's a lot more. Imagine the entire valley of dry bones becoming people that were just laying around. And then you speak what the words that God gives you and the breath of life is breathed in them and then they start twitching and start standing and then they're not only standing, they're standing confident. Their loins are girded and they're ready for battle and God even calls them an army. They go from dead, so dead that their bones are dry to being a confident Sold to, to being confident soldiers whose feet are swift and ready for whatever the Son of Man may tell them that the Lord says next. And that leads us right into our epistle text. So we have a group of, of men who are quickened and ready for, for battle. Those who were once dead and are alive those who had no breath and who now have breath. I don't think that I need to spend a lot of time explaining exactly how that is like the unbaptized and the baptized. Those who are not baptized are dead in their trespasses and those who are baptized and believe have everlasting life. There's not a big leap there, and I'm, and I'm not going to waste your time uh, it, breaking down something that you simply understand by faith. The bones were, were bones. The people were dead. God said, say my words. He said the words. The people lived. They had breath. They were an army. And they were confident and prepared in the Lord. Now, on the other side of the cross and, and resurrection of our Lord, we see John saying this, which could be said about the people of Ezekiel. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except by the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I'm going to pause right there at verse, uh, right before verse 6. Because in our gospel text, we find the text that many people use to say that these are the keys that have been given to the church. The Roman Catholics say it is those who have been given to Peter. Uh, and, but Scripture simply says that it's given to the pastors. Peace I leave with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And when He had said this, He breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold this forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. And here's the real kicker though. In that text, uh, Lutherans and anyone who sees this text as forgiveness, uh, the confession of sins and the forgiveness of sins, um, see this text as me centric, especially pastors. They run right past all of this important information and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. oh, the catechism says that. If I say the sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. And if I withhold the sins, of sins then they're withheld. And that's that. If you, unre if you are unrepentant, then I got your sins. And if you are repentant, I got your forgiveness. But they miss the point. Because the, the whole reason that Christ was able to the, the, whole, the whole reason that Christ says to them, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So he said to them, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold the sins, for, for, if, we, if you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. But why? 
because we've just glossed over the most important part. Peace be with you. And then he says it again. Peace be with you. He gives the office of the keys, which is what I was talking about in the small catechism, which I believe, teach and confess to be true. He, believe, he, he gives the office of the keys to pastors so that, they can ha so that the people can have peace. We, don't, we shouldn't make it about ourselves and say, we have the authority to do this and then lord it over the people. That's nonsense. It is good, it is meat right and salutary that we should withhold the sins of those who do, who do not repent and forgive the sins of those who do. Yet we are not to lord it over or preach on it every single Sunday. Because here's the point. The point is that that was given, the keys were given to unlock the gates of heaven so that peace could be with us here on earth. That's the whole point. When, when the pastor says, I forgive you of all of your sins that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the pastor shouldn't, shouldn't turn around and go, good job, pastor. You're so good at that. No, it, the whole reason of speaking is so that we can all have peace. And we can only have peace where Christ is. Therefore, when the pastor says, I, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He has spoken the word of Christ and therefore the word of Christ is in the midst of them. And where Christ is, we have a foretaste of the feast to come. Where Christ is, we shall be also. And while we're on this earth, where we are, and where we who are poor but who were poor but dry and dry bones who were wetted by the water of holy baptism in the word we hear Christ comes to us to remind us that when we die and we are dry bones he comes to us to tell us that we will be with him later in paradise and that he will come to judge both the living and the dead. So, pastors would do well not to, not to see the, the, the office of the keys as the ultimate key into heaven. The ultimate key, lock and key into heaven is not the stole. The office of the key of heaven is this. I believe I don't I believe that I do not believe that Pentecost was the creation of the church. So I'm, I, 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 need, I need to to put that out there. I don't believe that 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 Pentecost was when the church was created. I do believe that that's when they were ordained and prepared for the ministry. But I believe, teach and confess, that the church began when the spear entered the side of Jesus Christ. Because once the spirit, or once, the, once the sword, the, the, excuse me, the spear, the spear entered into the body of the dead and therefore an already atoned Jesus Christ, what poured forth from him was the church. Water and blood. Water from baptism, blood for the Lord's Supper. These aren't symbolical things. These are actual merits from Christ hanging from the cross. And they pour, that's why I love it in art so much when you see the angels capturing the blood in the chalice and capturing the water in the font. In that stabbing, you find the church. You find the marks of the church. You find the means of grace. You find, the, you find that in the, in the water that comes from Christ's side, your bones are left at the bottom of the font. And there you are, a body with sinew, flesh, skin, and breath from the Holy Spirit. And then on the other side, we have the blood of Christ that comes from the side where, that we eat and drink 
for the forgiveness of sins. Given to us as a special comfort that we would know and take with us Christ's body for the forgiveness of sins and that we take with us the forgiveness of sins wherever we go. And so the lock and key that is of the most importance is not the lock and key of the pastoral office. While important, the most important lock and key, and Thomas learns this lesson well, is that the key is the finger of Thomas and the lock is the side of Christ. Because, see, Thomas speaks for all of us when he says, unless I see the hands and the marks of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Until I witness these things, I'm not going to believe. In other words, seeing it is believing it. But that's not really how faith works. And then eight days later, which is a number that's not lost on us, Thomas comes back and he's sitting with them and he's still, poor guy, still, ha I don't know if the, if the name calling had started at this point, but doubting Thomas was there. Um, and you know, the, the, guy, the, the guy makes one comment and he's stuck with that name forever. Eight days later, the doors were locked and Christ says for a third time, peace be with you. And Thomas, who did not believe, Thomas the sinner, Thomas the doubter, he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your finger and place it in my side. And once you do this, do not disbelieve, but believe. And there is the lock and the key. The gate of heaven is in the side of Christ. And the key is our finger that is carried by the Holy Spirit into the side of Jesus. And that is when the door, as Christ calls himself, is unlocked. And all the gifts that flow from him are given. That's what baptism is. It takes our finger. It takes our key. And it places it inside the lock of Christ's side. And everlasting life is opened up. The church is opened up. Baptism is opened up. The Lord's Supper is opened up. The church is opened up. And then, then we believe. And our answer is simply, my Lord and my God, there's nothing else to say. We see the exclamation point. The emphasis is in the Greek. So it can be said, my Lord and my God, or my Lord and my God. Either way, it's an epiphany. All things have been opened up to me. The door. He truly is the door. And He has opened up for me all sinlessness, all forgiveness, all heaven, everlasting life. And then on the last day, He will raise those dry bones up to confess Him once again. And so within that lock and key, we find the comfort of the pastoral role in the church that you can hear the forgiveness of sins and be reminded of the lock and key because we don't find forgiveness simply in platitudes we find forgiveness in the word that is Jesus Christ so when the pastor says I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can be assured that it is, it, it, as, it is as if Christ Himself were saying it to you. Not by any power or, or authority in me. 
but because of the side of Christ that poured forth his merits and that he himself three times said, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. Now go and make sure that my peace is with others, forgiving sins of the penitent and withholding the sins of the impenitent, that their hearts may be broken from their hardness and softened to repentance and then forgive them. Give them the peace that I'm giving you now. Behold my side and behold everlasting life. This wound, open from the cross, shall never close. For after the resurrection, it still flows forth. Holy baptism, the Lord's Supper, the gift of life and the gift of nourishment, the foretaste of the feast to come that will come when our bones, by the words, through baptism and through the nourishment, the last day, grow sinew, grow flesh, and grow skin. And we will, be, and we will confess Behold, Christ has made me his key, and he has unlocked by the blood of his Son, or by Christ himself, has unlocked the gates of heaven and everlasting life. I have seen, and I believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.